As I was sitting there listening during the first panel, I thought about many experiences in my own life where people have come to my door. I thought about when I lived in the United Kingdom and my next door neighbor who was a Muslim from Pakistan invited my wife and I over for dinner with him and his family and they shared their faith with us and uh, tried to tell us about what was great about Islam and listened about our faith as well. But this panel is specifically about the policy implications. And let me mention four to foreshadow some of the comments from this panel. One of those political implications has to do with human rights. And one of the panelists has talked about, and I think we'll hear about in their remarks, about balancing converging human rights considerations, such as the individual right to free speech and conscience on the one hand, and the rights of indigenous communities on the other. A second political implication that we'll hear about is whether or not there's a rationale for some sort of international regulation on missionary activity. Third is the question about what should US foreign policy be with regards to defending its citizens abroad? Many of us have watched this story in Haiti about US citizens who took, uh, as missionaries who took children or were trying to take children out of the country ostensibly to an orphanage and what should the U.S. government do on behalf of its citizens when there's this mixture of proselytism, of faith, of law? And then fourth, let me juxtapose two positions. One of our panelists has written that, uh, that there's a misperception of intentions when the U.S. engages in the Muslim world, that there's an unfortunate reputation of missionaries mopping up after military intervention in the Muslim world. Contrast that viewpoint with those who would say that the U.S. has been the greatest friend to human rights in the region possible. It was the U.S. who helped liberate Muslims in Bosnia and then in Kosovo. It was the U.S. who's been on the side of Muslims in Darfur and called it genocide. It was the U.S. who played a strong role in liberating Muslims in Afghanistan and Iraq from tyranny. Juxtapose those very two different positions about the implications, the perceptions of U.S. intent in the greater Muslim world. Well, with that, I'm going to turn it to our first speaker for today, Salam al Marayati, who's the executive director of the Muslim Political Action Committee. The mission of IMPAC is that it's an American institution which informs and shapes public opinion and policy by serving as a trusted resource to decision makers in government, media, and policy institutions and it's committed to developing leaders with the purpose of enhancing the political and civic participation of American Muslims. You can see from the biography in your booklet that he has a, a, a lengthy resume of speaking and written appearances over the past 20 years. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Salam al Mariati. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank uh, Tom Farr for inviting me for this very uh, important panel and discussion on proselytism and religious freedom. Uh, I'd like to define the problem a little differently. I don't think the problem is religion and religious uh, witnessing, sharing, proselytism, uh, or conversion. Uh, I think the problem is ideological pro proselytism. And ideological proselytism has a narrow view of the world that is being imposed on others to homogenize cultures to a set of views by a power uh, or a group that is trying to convert people to their narrow ideology that does not serve public interest or human rights, but serves their political interests uh, or special interests. And I think we have to broaden the issue of proselytism. And many times ideological proselytism takes on a religious veneer or a religion. And I think the case in Iran, for example, is a perfect illustration of that point, where the dissent is coming from the people, meaning that the governing body is not really representing the public interest, but a narrow ideological uh, point of view. If you, as has been stated before, when you, th there is no compulsion in matters of faith uh, that comes directly out of, out of the Quran. So if you impose Islam, then it is not Islam anymore. By the same token, if you impose democracy, it is not democracy anymore. Uh, so there's a difference between trying to reform and advance human rights on the one hand 
and trying to homogenize a group of people to a narrow points of views that is really only serving one class uh, or one religion uh, or more uh, uh, accurately one group uh, within a religion. Because when we look at religious conflicts in the world, there are more intra-faith conflicts than there are inter-faith conflicts. Yes, there are problems, obviously, in interfaith conflicts, but if we look in Pakistan, the majority of the problems are between Sunni and Shia and Ismaili and Ahmadis and so on and so forth. And, and, and the same for most uh, of the Muslim uh, world for that, for that matter. And I believe the same issues uh, occur within Christianity uh, among its different uh, uh, de denominations. Having said that, I do believe that religion plays an instrumental role in advancing human rights because you cannot believe in one God without believing in one human family and without having that conviction to advance the interests of human dignity and human rights. So the belief in one God and human rights uh, are inseparable. Uh, and in my opinion, they are a means to achieving liberation, justice, uh, and decency in, in our society and throughout human history. And again, in our religion, the, the final point to us is, as, as the Quran says, to you be your religion and to, to me be my religion. And, and, and also, uh, the Quran elaborates on that point. It says, to each of you, we, God, has made a different law and a different way. And if it were God's will, he would have made you into one community. He could have made you into one community. But he tests you differently with the different circumstances uh, you, you are presented with. Therefore, compete for doing good work. And then later on, after this life, God will explain to you uh, everything. So what God is telling the Muslims don't entangle yourselves in theological argumentation. And when we say da'wah, which is misinterpreted as conversion, it means invite, invite people to the way of God, which is the way of justice, the way of decency. Uh, and when you, when you get into theological argumentation, you are de demonizing other faiths, and that is not the will uh, of God. So ideally, we have religious groups can advance their interests through exemplary behavior by doing good work, as many Christian groups and Muslim groups do, I believe. They are really helping the needy, the underserved, out of religious obligation. And when we have earthquakes and floods, floods and other disasters, it's they are the religious groups that are first to come and serve the needs of the people. Whether it is through indigenous, like in Egypt, it's usually the Muslim groups that help in natural disasters, or in Haiti, international religious groups are the first responders uh, to those um, uh, devastating circumstances. I believe there needs to be an international body that regulates uh, religious work abroad for the sake and the safety of religious workers. Because we have, unfortunately now, in, in the post 9-11 era, certain treasury guidelines that really confuse the issue. Because if religious groups want to do work overseas, they have to report certain things to the government. In other words, there is a misperception now that missionary workers, Religious international aid workers are now being perceived as agents of U.S. intelligence or U.S. law enforcement, which reinforces this notion that missionaries are just mopping up for U.S. military uh, confrontations. Case in point is the Gulf War. In the first Gulf War, the whole issue was we're trying to defend the human rights uh, of the Iraqi, uh, of, of the Kuwaitis and there were fabrications of babies thrown out of incubators uh, by Iraqi soldiers that led to a, 
a, a fervor to go to war in the first Gulf War. Then in the second Gulf War, there were other points that were used to invoke uh, or, or, or used to promote war. But afterwards, Christian relief groups and missionaries in particular were given preferential access to relief in Iraq over Muslims. Actually, there were Muslims who were trying to do relief work in Iraq. They are in jail or they are penalized, whereas Christian groups are given preferential treatment. That double standard, if only a perceived double standard, makes that point that that we are endangering Christian workers uh, in the way the policy is being uh, conducted. Therefore, I believe that an international code of consensus is important. The last thing uh, I, I would like to, to say is that for religions, I believe that the best way to spread the word is to spread the word to your own people first. If Muslims become better Muslims and follow the Quran, and Christians become better Christians and follow the Bible, and Jews follow the, uh, the Torah and the Talmud, then all this problem of religious conflicts and a violation of religious freedom would, by and large, uh, a lot of it would be taken care of. But thinking that you are going to go and convert somebody to your tribe means that you are undermining the whole notion of the concept of the one God, because then God, you, you, you are not serving God, you are asking God now to serve you and your team, your football team. You want more people on your team than the other team. So religion was not meant to, to be tallied into who's on which team. Religion without justice, without a true movement for liberation, without decency, uh, becomes a means of exploitation. Uh, so let us remember that the initial tenets of the faiths, all the faiths, especially under the religions of, of monotheism, is meant to Believe in one God, believe in one human family, and to do good work. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think we rival the Tim Shaw panel on brevity. So <laughs> thank you for those hard-hitting and smart and terse remarks. Our second panelist today is Reverend Leah D. Daughtry, who's pastor of the House of Lord Church here in Washington, DC. You see in her bio a long record of public service and of political service, uh, most recently as the CEO of the 2008 Democratic National Convention in Denver, Colorado, and six years as the Chief of Staff to the Democratic National Committee. And I seem to recall that during that tenure, it was widely reported that she would fine Howard Dean every time he swore, <laughs> raising money for her church. And I wonder if that's a form of proselytism. <laughs> uh, we look forward to her comments. Reverend Daughtry. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to share with you. And thanks especially to my friend, Dr. Farr, for his ongoing work in this arena and for bringing us all together to talk about uh, this important issue of uh, proselytism and religious freedom. Um, I'm going to say that you've heard my bio, and uh, to date I've worked on seven presidential campaigns, uh, and I don't know how many midterm elections and mayoral elections, but I'm first a pastor, uh, fifth generation pastor, in a denomination that uh, seeks to actively engage uh, members in civic activity. So I'm going to talk to you based on my experience at the intersection of those two things uh, as a political operative and as someone who uh, actively encourages people to share their faith and to be involved in the political arena. I'm not an academic. I'm a pastor. So I'm going to make sure I keep my watch in front of me because, you know, pastors in front of a microphone is a dangerous thing. <laughs> 
I want to make three very broad points, and I hope we'll get to have some discussion about this later. Uh, first, regardless of our personal religious beliefs or lack thereof, we all engage in forms of proselytism every day. And business is called advertising. And the legislative process is called debate. And politics is called campaigning. And in each case, an entity discusses its merits and the advantages of its product in an attempt to win new customers, supporters, or voters. And there's nothing wrong with this. In fact, we encourage in this country the free exchange of ideas, believing that consumers, given the broadest span of information, are the most qualified to make the decisions that are best for them. When it comes to religion, we call it proselytism, and then we want to change the rules. But I would argue that the same rules apply, and there are instructive lessons to be learned from their application in the arena of faith. It's okay to talk about your product, or your legislation, or your candidate, or your faith. And it's okay to claim that you're the best. And it's okay to talk about the benefits of your product, and it's even okay to share your version of the consequences of not choosing your product. But it's not okay to arrest people because they don't buy your soap. And it's not okay to destroy someone's livelihood because they won't vote for your candidate. And it's not okay to threaten people with bodily harm because they don't adopt your faith. Proselytism is acceptable as long as there is no tangible, material, or physical consequence, good or bad, for the person hearing, accepting, or rejecting the message. The second point I want to make is proselytism is not a dirty word. Rather, in its best form, it is an excellent marker of a free society and must therefore be encouraged. When people, when individuals are able to freely express themselves, including but not limited to the sharing of their faith and speaking openly about their faith, and when individuals are freely able to make decisions based on their own interests, including but not limited to choice of religion or choosing no religion, you have the underpinnings of a free and open society. To go a step further, a democratic system of government and the political system that supports it are in fact dependent on the ability of its citizens to speak and choose for themselves. Now, while as political operatives, we cannot be in the business of favoring one, re one religion over another, we can support and defend the right of those groups to actively engage in persuasion, as we would call it in politics, persuasion tactics to win folks to their side. And let's face it, every political party in a democratic society wants voters who are able to reason, evaluate, compare and choose wisely, with wisely being in the eye of the beholder. Now, whether you're the proselytizer or the proselytizee, these are the kinds of people we want, able to make a good argument and persuade others to your point of view, or defend against a reasoned argument and stand your ground, or just listen to an argument and ultimately make the decision that is in your best interest. Now, this is not to say that proselytism is not without challenges. And that brings me to my third broad point. Solutions to the challenges of proselytism, I believe, lie with faith leaders and not with individual adherents. While we may choose to encourage and support faith sharing in societal circles, we must also understand that there must be parameters or rules of engagement in which proselytism is conducted. And these parameters must be understood, adopted, and encouraged by leaders in faith communities. We have to acknowledge that faith leaders have enormous influence within their communities. And it is through it, it they are conferred the ability to engage their individual communities for good or for bad in the right way to proselytize. This represents for us a shift from the normal retail politics in which the target audience is the individual 
and engagement with community leadership is done merely out of respect. While individual adherents are certainly a key component of proselytism, faith leaders are critically important in any discussion about appropriate engagement tactics. They hold the key and are the difference between the fair and opening sharing of one's faith and the coercive, punitive, exclusionary tactics that can make a society unlivable, unlivable and ungovernable and ultimately lead to a loss of religious freedom for everyone. I'm gonna stop there. This is a record for a preacher. <laughs> I'm gonna stop there and uh, leave and go to my colleague and then we can have some more discussion later. Thank you. Wonderful, I see that many of you are taking notes furiously. I think there's gonna be an avalanche of questions uh, when we come to the question and answer time. Our third panelist is Matt K. Richards, uh, who's a shareholder at, at a Salt Lake City law firm. He's also a faculty member, a fellow of the International Center for Law and Religious Studies at Brigham Young University. He is a published author. There's more in his bio there in front of you, and I'm going to turn it over to him at this time. Matt. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for uh, inviting me, Tom, and also for being able to be on the panel with these, uh, with these guests. You know, it's, a, it's an interesting debate, isn't it? And some of what we're talking about here in this panel is a reaction to the questions that were posed to the last panel. So um, I think we can comment on that a little bit as well. Um, in fact, one thing that struck me from the earlier panel is that the focus of that discussion was on what the different faith traditions, uh, what their obligations are or are not with respect to proselytism. And um, to me, the whether or not a faith tradition encourages proselytism, those arguments are convincing to those who hold the same tradition or a similar tradition. But to me, the basis of whether or not we, with the borders of acceptable versus unacceptable proselytism in a larger pluralistic society really are rooted in human rights. And I think that's where our dialogue needs to be in terms of how we fo uh, fo uh, form policy decisions. Because I don't think we can talk about the borders of acceptable and unacceptable proselytism without understanding the underlying human rights that are involved. And I appreciate what uh, Richard Land said about the human rights earlier today. Because there is an inherent conflict between the right of religious liberties, which include both the right of expression and the right of manifesting uh, one's beliefs and religion and also the right of the, of the person, the proselytizee, to make an informed choice to understand and to accept or reject the message that's been presented, and then, of course, to change or adopt uh, religion if, if, that's, uh, if that's their view or to stick with what they've uh, initially, their initial views. And so that's on the one hand, and then on the other hand is the legitimate need of governments to regulate and the interests of others, including indigenous populations, and and uh, rights of uh, privacy and um, they, frankly just the right to hold opinions without interference. So we have th those conflict of rights and, and how, we, how we as a policy matter define the border between acceptable and unacceptable um, proselytism come down to how we, how we um, pair those competing rights together. And for, uh, for four reasons, I submit that the balance should be in favor of free expression and free informed choice. And that comes down to, uh, first, that these the, the rights of expression and manifesting and the right to choose of the target are both sides of, a similar, of the same coin, and that coin is the freedom of conscience, which underlies everything. As, as uh, uh, Ms. Daughtry said, it is the foundation of a democratic society. It's the ability for us to, to function and and that is fundamentally um, a protected human right under the international compacts and the Declaration of Human Rights. And it presumes a, a robust marketplace of ideas. One can't choose or speak with, uh, or can't choose among a palette of different options without having those options available and presented. And uh, on the other hand, the right of religious worship and, and manifesting and of, of expression is meaningless unless one can express uh, firmly held beliefs. And proselytism is a form of speech that offers choices. The second point is that 
religious persuasion should be pr uh, protected like other forms of speech. And we've heard a little bit about that earlier, uh, just a moment ago. And, it, and speech expression should not be limited by subject matter or the speaker. The third point is that regulations that restrict uh, the ability to proselytize uh, from a, a religious view or belief often favor a dominant religion or a dominant ideology. And at, at a fundamental level, when they're not going to protect health and safety, but if, they're, if the regulation is intended to restrict the palette of choices that one can choose from, then those regulations are a form of proselytism themselves. They're, and in some ways, they're paternalistic because they limit the choice that's, that's uh, offered to someone. The target, at the, uh, the proselytizee, needs to have the opportunity to choose for him or herself. And then the last uh, point, which I, I think underscores the reason of why the balance ought to favor the expression in the marketplace of ideas, is that just as um, Dr. Daughtry mentioned, we are accustomed to making those kinds of choices. We routinely do it in all facets of our life, and, and we ought to be able to do the same in our religious and uh, life stance choices. Of course, some restrictions on um, proselytism are necessary for the preservation of health and safety, uh, preserving the freedom of choice. If, if uh, European Court of Human Rights uh, cases uh, demonstrate that it is appropriate to make some limitations on proselytism in order to preserve the rights of, of freedom of conscience, for example. The Larissa's case is an example of that. In that case, there was a, um, in a military hierarchical society, uh, superiors were proselytizing uh, those under their direction. And the court held that that was improper because of the circumstances that removed the, the freedom of choice on behalf of the, those who were being proselytized. And so there are uh, legitimate regulations in those circumstances, or similar circumstances. There are also, it's prop, uh, it, it may be possible to have time, place, and manner restrictions. However, restrictions should be narrowly focused and tailored. They should, and it's exceptionally difficult to do that, to tailor it in onto what defines, for example, coercion. In the, there are different points of view about what constitute coercion. And I'll give an example. In the Kokonakis case, Kokonakis versus Greece, which is another European Court of Human Rights case, there is, uh, there there's the majority opinion and then there are opinions of, of the judges who didn't prevail in that decision. And the court held that the tactics of the Jehovah's Witness were not coercive. And so they didn't constitute proselytism. That was inappropriate. But on the other hand, the minority judges rather stridently said that, that those teaching tactics. Here the Jehovah's Witness went into a person's house, stayed about 10 to 15 minutes to, to express a message, and, but the, the minority judges held that that was coercive. It was a rape of the, of the um, conscience, and that's a quote, and uh, so rather strident in those views. Another example of the difficulty of coming together and expressing um, how, how you define what's appropriate or inappropriate is an inducement. And I think we, I think I haven't heard anybody say that it's a it, we ought to be in the position of bribing somebody to, to join a religious uh, a congregation. I don't think anybody would suggest that. Um, so material inducements, direct material inducements, are in, I think are approachable. I think everybody agrees to that. On the other hand, there are indirect ideas. And so we've heard today discussions about somebody handing out the $500 check, or we've had, um, or, or just the idea that's inherent in any form of, of witness that we have something to offer that might elevate your life or make it a better place. And that's inherent in any message, that we're going to help you become better. Well, does that, how, what's the difference between that kind of an indirect inducement that you can become part of a community and the indirect, and the direct, more reproachable inducement? I think it's a difficult line to draw in some respects. But it comes down to having um, regulations that focused that if there is a regulation or some ill to be, to be regulated, it needs to be narrowly tailored. And at the end of the day, policy should favor a, a robust marketplace of ideas as a fundamental 
ex expression of human rights. I want to comment for a few minutes on codes of conduct. There, um, to my last count, uh, I've identified 16 different codes of conduct, and these are uh, ethical guidelines that have been produced and are in the process of being produced by a number of different NGOs or ecumenical groups. And, uh, and the question was raised whether these um, can be an effective alternative to international regulation. And, uh, you know, that's an interesting question. And I'm, I'm aware of a study that's going on now, for example, on this issue. And the, is and the, the initial conclusions of that study are interesting. And their view is that, that, the, that the motivation of the code drafter, the people that are putting together these ethical guidelines, largely predicts whether it's going to be a relevant or a le uh, legitimate approach. The best codes of conduct are, um, tend to be drafted by uh, NGOs that, that are interested in, pro in promoting a debate about this balance that we talked about earlier between uh, the rights of expression and choice on religious matters and beliefs, and then the, the restriction of those to preserve um, identities or um, cultures. The uh, best codes of conduct are rooted in those human rights and relate back to them and recognize and understand them, and then have some guidance in terms of how uh, a faith community can respect cultures, can respect ideas and uh, um, of, of others, and promote their viewpoints in a way that, that minimizes the conflicts. Their role is, I think, um, I would agree with what Dr. Daughtry said in terms of the, the fundamental uh, the basis of how one regulates ought to be with the, with the religious organization itself in terms of self-regulation, uh, at least with respect to these codes that are promoting rather amorphous concepts of, of respect and sometimes tend to be in the eye of the beholder and wouldn't substitute as, as law in the sense that they would be difficult to enforce in a, in a strict way. And uh, finally, talking about the implications of, of uh, proselytism, I've, in, in a, in, on uh, political, and economic implications. I think there's a really interesting uh, intersection. A couple of, uh, of scholars, I think, including uh, Roger Fink, who I think is going to be on the panel later today, so I won't steal any of his thunder. But I do. I'm. I'm I think his uh, uh, conclusions with Brian Grimm and another study by Paul Marshall are interesting in that they note a high degree of correlation between an open society that allows for uh, proselytizing, allows for the free expression and the open marketplace of ideas. There's a high degree of correlation between that uh, approach and economic development and, of course, civil rights in general. And we can talk more specifically about that if that's of interest to you. And then the last point, I, uh, in terms of what the United States ought to do, I, um, the United States ought to continue its, its role as an advocate of, of free uh, human rights in general. And these, the right to engage in proselytizing is an important component of that, but it's one component of human rights. And it ought not to be uh, second best to other forms of human rights. There's no reason, as we mentioned, to treat freedom of expression differently when the subject is religion than when the subject is politics or um, another issue. And partnering, the United States ought to partner with other groups that are interested in this so that it does not become just a, a, an American issue, but it's an issue that, that ought to be something at the forefront of international dialogue. And I'll conclude there. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, we've had three stimulating uh, sets of remarks at this point, and I'm going to open it up at this point for questions. We have microphones that are out in the audience, and I just ask three things. If you'd please identify yourself. Second, as a courtesy to those around you, if you would keep your remarks brief. And third, if you would frame them in the form of a question so that the panel could respond to you. So do we have any questions at this point in time? Go ahead. 
Hi, I'm Jordan Pendergrass. And my question is, as a student here at Georgetown, I've um, engaged in religious conversations with langu English language learners here from the Middle East. And I'm, I'm not exactly sure if, if my understanding of Dawa is correct. Why could I not have those similar religious conversations in their native countries? Um, and anybody could comment, but mainly for the Sarandian. Sure. Is, please. I guess that question is directed to me. So it's very simple. Uh, you cannot have the same kinds of conversations in the Middle East as you can here uh, because of one, of one of my fellow panelists just uh, alluded to is because we have an open society here. Uh, we have a free democratic society here, uh, whereas where they come from, th they are mainly uh, under totalitarian regimes. And I think sometimes we confuse the issue of religion with uh, the problem of dictatorships. Uh, and a lot of these issues of persecution come from dictatorships. Uh, and the dictatorship, again, represents one group or one person that says, if you don't agree with that person, then you are a threat to the state. So therefore, there is no freedom of conscience for anyone. And the majority of the victims, I would argue, uh, in those countries are Muslims. The majority of the people in prison in those countries are Muslim prisoners uh, who may have promoted a certain religious understanding or a religious point of view that the state considered a threat to them. And again, I point to Iran. There are many Muslim dissidents to the Iranian regime today. And the same for Saudi Arabia, Egypt, Libya, uh, all of these countries, there is no freedom uh, like we enjoy the freedoms here today. Uh, and, and, and that is the main reason why you don't have that uh, same conversation. Now, in terms of dawah, uh, dawah in the Quran means invitation, to invite. The Quran doesn't say invite people to convert to Islam. Uh, the Quran says, invite people to the way of your Lord with wisdom and with nice admonition and for the purpose of creating something better for society. So that's the context of dawah. If, it, if dawah becomes, again, a vehicle for imposing or pushing one narrative because it is associated with a power, then that's a whole different set of circumstances, and it's not, it's not proselytism, it's not witnessing, it's not da'wah, it's, it's none of the above, it's something different. Thank you. Thank you. Was there a hand back here on the right? Cole? Uh, uh, Cole Durham from Brigham Young University. Uh, one of the things that's striking to me about discussions about proselytism is they have something like the Kokonakis model in mind, that is the isolated person who goes out and talks to other people and tries to convert them. One of the things that is never really focused on is what happens after that, because my experience watching my own religion, what happens to people who join my own religious community and people who become Jehovah's Witnesses or any number of others, there's often substantial reverse pressure, uh, call it proselytism, call it coercion, to uh, pull people back. Uh, it seems to me that this is uh, the right to persuade people to change back is obviously legitimate, but often the, the kinds of pressures, there's an asymmetry in talking about these issues that somehow pressure, if you're the sort of the initial uh, con converter or missionary or whatever uh, is one thing, and then a lot of unstated pressures that go in the, the reverse direction are not uh, looked at. And there's a lot of coercion ranging from problems that people will have with employment opportunities, uh, uh, prob various kinds of social pressures, to the extreme cases such as the uh, the uh, uh, capital offense for conversion from Islam, from Islam 
uh, in some countries, in some places. Uh, and and that, uh, I, I recognize there are a range of theological views within Islam on that point, but that's, that's a complicated one. So I just wonder if the panel could speak to those, I, I think they're overlooked asymmetries in the coercion and pressure issue. We focus so much on the initial conversion and not on what happens afterwards and reverse pressures. If you Thank could you. comment on that. Why don't we start at my left and we'll work our way this way for anyone who wants to comment. So let me do it. Uh, you know, again, I, I don't, I, I don't want to get into uh, specific country or country specific concerns uh, without looking at what the Islamic principles are uh, because we won't have time to go through all the countries but I can just talk about this issue of of this uh, notion of a capital offense uh, for conversion uh, or what's called apostasy uh, and that definitely there's a lot of confusion over that issue uh, including uh, among Muslims. And, and let me just, again, speak directly from the text. There is no apostasy punishment in Islam. Uh, the Quran specifically says those who leave the religion and come back and then leave the religion and come back and then leave, in, in other words, don't keep doing that. Implicitly there, there is an allowance for people to leave the religion. Now, there are some hadiths uh, reported sayings uh, of the prophet that allude to situations where people have left uh, the faith. And let me name, let me go into two examples. Um, when it is reported that if somebody leaves the faith, then you have the right to go uh, and kill him, that was within the context of a war where if you converted to the other side therefore, and leave the Muslim side, that is not religious apostasy, that is treason, treason to the state. And so we have therefore different sets of definitions between what we're looking at today and what was taking place at that time. And definitely throughout the Crusaders era, that's exactly what happened. If people converted to the enemy side, that is actually an act of treason that threatened the security of the state it doesn't threaten the religion. Religion no, doesn't need protection. Religion will continue regardless of what we do and sometimes in spite of what we do. So that's, that's one thing. The other example of the prophet that I think is important, there was a person during the time of the migration between Mecca and Medina, the companions found out that one of the people actually developed a plan with the enemy against the prophet and wanted to kill the prophet when he arrived uh, in Medina. And they caught that person. And the prophet said, don't hurt him. Let him go. So here is an example of amnesty to somebody that actually convert, was a, a cons considered a hypocrite, somebody who was against the faith, converted to the other side, acted in, 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 a, uh, in, in treason, but still the prophet gave him uh, amnesty. So I think those are the principled examples that we have to talk about. What happens in parts of South Asia or the Middle East, I think, again, is very political. Uh, and in my opinion, was blasphemy law was introduced into that region during the time of colonialism from British or European systems that do have laws that defend one church or one set uh, of people over the other. And I think that has created a lot of confusion into where this issue of the right uh, of, of conversion and the right uh, of, of choice, free choice uh, in Islam, which I think is very clear in terms of the principles. I would uh, respond to that uh, beginning where I ended, which is the need for us on this particular issue to engage faith leaders because it's very difficult to argue logically that the same principles of free speech that, uh, that you want to protect you in your faith 
and your ability to share your faith openly with others should you can now deny to other people when they choose to leave your faith. Uh, that's, it's an illogical argument. Um, so it, I think you've got to almost go back to the leadership of the communities that, that practice this sort of thing. And I think it happens around the world and it happens here in the United States, in various faith traditions who believe that certain offenses should cut you off from the community. Uh, but I think for, for Christianity, Christianity is built on the notion of free will and your ability to choose God or not, uh, but that choice is left up to you. And the consequences of not choosing are not mine to meet out. Those consequences are for God to meet out at the time he chooses to meet those out, which in my theology is uh, at the end of days. So I would have a hard time saying to people, you know, do I want to lose members? Do I want to lose people? I think I've got the answer to all of life's problems. And I think if you just do what I believe like I believe, then everything will be great. But I know that's not going to happen. But it's not, it is, it is, it is indefensible for me to argue that if you leave, what, leave my tradition, then somehow you should be cut off from job opportunity, from life opportunity, from, from community. And then still, I want the protections of the free speech, and I want the protections of being able to proselytize, but then I don't want to, I, I want to deny those from other people. I think that's problematic. And the only way to really resolve that is through, I think, uh, direct and honest dialogue and continued engagement with the leaders of the community who are able to uh, change that culture. And, I, and it sounds very, I know it sounds very easy and you know broad brush, but I think that's really where it starts because it comes from the top down. And if the leaders don't, enforce that kind of thinking in their community, then it becomes this trickle down effect where we all cutting each other off from each other and cutting off community and, and, and meeting out consequences that are really not ours to meet out. I, I just wanna agree with that. I think that it's incumbent on the faith community to be, uh, to self-regulate. I think that there's a practical reason for it too because um, there are reprisals and we see that um, as evidenced by what uh, as Salam was saying earlier, in, in terms of how uh, those have come, uh, the restrictions or the anti-conversion laws have come come about, but I think you know we see it today in uh, in East Europe, where because of uh, concerns about proselytism, there are now um, under consideration additional regulations about that. But it has to be there. There needs to be parity. And I appreciate Cole's question because. Uh, on the one hand, we're focused on worries about coercion in the in the initial proselytism, in the inv invitation, and I. I like what, I really like that one in terms of what it means as an invitation because that's how I view what proselytism ought to be, an invitation to mm -hmm. say, so here's what I think and, and you have the option to choose to, to follow that or not. But if one follows that, uh, if one accepts what the uh, proselytizer brings, then uh, there ought to be limits to in terms of what the reaction to that choice of, uh, is. And so that there is a full and ample choice in terms of one's uh, ability to choose the faith or belief or life stance that he or she wants to assert. Super. Right here. I'm Dr. Marianne Kuzumanalov from Catholic University and the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Very specific question on this line. Uh, where is the line between proselytism and, and witness and invitation and codes of conduct? For a U.S. military chaplain, perhaps operating in Afghanistan, uh, the U.S. government law says proselytism is not allowed. Yet, is it allowed for him to give a Bible in native languages, in tribal languages, as a gift? You know, at what line? At what is the line between personal witness and uh, the, which is allowable versus acting as an agent of the U.S. government in uniform? Where is intimidation or coercion versus witness? Well, if I could just just two points real quickly. Number one, I think we. From an American standpoint, we have to also be very careful in separating church and state. Uh, I, you know, for, for government now to, and government officials to be promoting a religion, uh, especially overseas, I think is very problematic. Uh, and there have been some indicators of that uh, already domestically. For example, there was a, I think a Lieutenant Colonel William Boykin, when referring to Somalia, he said, it was, uh, I think, something like our God over their God. 
So that alludes to a mentality within certain parts of the military that creates tensions not only overseas but among non-Christian or people of, of, who are not of that ideology within the military and within our government. Uh, and again, in Islam, there's a separation of the ulama and the state, the scholars in the state. So an independent judiciary, independent thinking away from what government is promoting or protecting, uh, especially dominant faiths, uh, is very, very, very uh, important. Number two, um, the issue of now the government through the military is proselytizing uh, in, in uh, uh, overseas. It obviously creates this notion of okay, here comes this, this idea of the crusaders again. That religion is, the, 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 that Christianity in particular is mopping up for the crusades in the Muslim world. And this is a narrative that does exist, unfortunately. So we have to be very sensitive to that, that issue. Uh, chaplains should be chaplains for those in the military. Uh, and I think that's the extent of it. Leah or Matt, any comments on that? Yeah, I would agree with um, his comments, particularly as it regards the issue of the separation of church and state. Uh, from my view, when in the particular example that you raise, if you're a military chaplain, ostensibly when you sign up and agree that you're going to be a military chaplain, the, you're clear about the, what the rules of engagement are and that you are clear, one would think, about the lines in terms of if you, what your responsibilities are, and obviously, if you're a military chaplain, you're not a, and you're not hired to be a Christian chaplain. And uh, in, in some spaces, uh, I do a lot of work in prison ministry, for example, where there are specific chaplains for specific faiths. And so, when you go to see that chaplain, you know that what you're getting from that chaplain is a specific viewpoint because that's what they're hired to be. Is the, is the imam or the rabbi or the minister for that facility. If, if, the, if the title and the, and the responsibilities are broader, to that, broader than that than just to offer, to just offer spiritual sustenance without a particular set of viewpoint, I, my, my idea would be that that's clear to you when you sign up, uh, or it should be clear to you when you sign up, and so you have to back bench which, what your personal uh, theology may be in order to serve everyone uh, and, and not be in a position of proselytizing. At the point you cross that line, at the point, point that you step over the guidelines of what's been provided to you, then at that point that it's a problem. And, and I think you, you run the risk, you are violating your code and you run the risk of doing exactly what he said, which is stepping over just pure sharing to, uh, um, to a proselyti proselytization in a space where it's not appropriate. I'll just agree that I think it's problematic for someone in uniform to become a missionary too. I'm gonna take the chair's prerogative to make one extent, uh, extension of these remarks about this issue, and that is that this is a, that there's a wider set of issues obviously going on for uh, military chaplains at present, and point you to two publications that you could look at uh, that I think Dr. Love is familiar with, but that perhaps the audience isn't. And since the wars, since the US involvement in the Balkans, there have been chaplain engagement with other religious leaders as religious leader liaisons. And let me tell a little different story than the one about the Bible, and that is imagine that you are a military commander, a U.S. commander in Iraq, and you're engaging with local tribal leaders, and they show up for the meeting with their holy man, to use their parlance. And they wonder where your holy man is. Isn't he an important advisor on cultural issues? Why isn't your chaplain there beside you? And, and the U.S. has been responding to this since Bosnia in specific, but especially in Iraq and now in Afghanistan. And two publications, if you're interested in these issues, one is what's called Joint Publication 105, which is the military document on this. A new release came out in November of 2009. And the second one is, is that a recent issue of the Review of Faith and International Affairs, I think the, uh, the fall issue for 2009, specifically deals with this issue and many stories, so the theory and the practice in the field. And 
you could avail yourself of those things. Other questions? Sure. Sir, would you, would you, yeah, the, the, okay, Alan Wisdom with the Institute on Religion and Democracy. Matthew Richards raised the question of inducement, and frequently there are accusations when, when, when there are issues of conversion that inducements have been offered, and it seems to me that this is a very difficult issue, particularly in countries with a lot of poverty where there's not a social safety net offered by the government where people really have to look to communities to support them in difficult circumstances, and often it's religious communities, and so changing from one religious community to another, it really involves moving from one social support network to another, and perhaps one network is going to be much more comprehensive than another. Um, and that makes it much more difficult than in a society like the United States, where we do have a social safety net uh, you know, maybe not what everyone would want it to be, um, but most people don't depend on their religious group to support them in, in difficult circumstances. And religious groups that do offer support tend to, tend to offer material support to all people without regard to their affiliation, and it's mainly kind of psychological and spiritual support that is offered just to members of the community. So I wonder if you could comment on kind of that question of inducement, particularly in these situations of, of poverty um, w without a social safety net. Sure. Matt? I'd be happy to address that. I, you know, I, I mentioned that I think it's a difficult boundary between what direct inducement is and this uh, uh, indirect inducement that just comes as being part of a community. I, I guess I just want to comment that there's not much motivation on the part of a church to, um, to give inducements. Um, because it, there's no incentive to the to proselytize, I guess, what for lack of a better term, freeloaders, um, who will be a drain on the religious community. And there might be minor aberrations where uh, a, a congregation or a missionary uh, wants to inflate membership or for ostensible, you know, success, maybe their funding or something. But at the end of the day, there's no institutional interest to ensure lasting conversions by those who will positively contribute to the faith community. So you know, the people that they want, that, that, that religious groups want to have join their flock is are people who, who have a long-term ability to contribute. So of course, there's a, there's a benefit to part, being part of a community. I know that in my faith tradition, um, issues of humanitarian aid are, are separated from, from any missionary involvement so that the missionaries are not involved with giving humanitarian aid to remove the perception of of inducements, and they're also caretaken <coughs> even within a community when there's some assistance given on an individual level to make sure that that the person being converted is not is not um, doing it for the ulterior motive of just uh, of getting uh, some benefit out of it. So, for example, there's an interview given by someone who's not the missionary to make sure to test the the sincerity of the conviction of the person being being uh, that's coming into the faith. And I think it's important that, that those issues be separate, um, but it, it's a difficult balance, isn't it? Leah, Ursula? I agree with what's already been said. I agree. We have agreement <laughs> on this panel. <laughs> Great. Thank you for being patient on that. No problem. My name is Bennett Graham. I work with the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty. And Reverend Daughtry and Mr. Richards, you both have touched a lot on the responsibilities of faith leaders to accept codes of conduct. Um, and I think that that is especially incumbent upon American religious leaders and, and all religious leaders. But my question is uh, related to two cultural challenges that seem to be more related to the, in the international context. Uh, one of those being the historical problems um, and really the grappling of, of history. Uh, I think you see this in France uh, as an example. The, the headscarf ban really was presented as an issue where there was a fear that children, school children, were going to be forced to accept certain uh, principles, and in particular, these being principles that were not traditional to, to France. Uh, the other cultural challenge seems to be uh, an American understanding of rights that is based on individual rights versus where most of the, the world approaches rights in a, in a communal sense. Um, I think a good example of this would be in India, where you see anti-conversion laws um, protecting communities rather than 
particular individuals. And so I'd be interested in your thoughts on those two cultural challenges that really are more applicable to the international context as opposed to the American domestic model. I'm thinking. Oh, I'll jump in. Um, I guess I'd push back just a little bit on the idea. Well, I know that there's a perception that um, that the idea of individual rights is an American concept, but really it's an, it, it underlies the, the human rights um, that have been uh, recognized and, and ought to be, um, I, I guess, more fully accepted in the international documents. So the Universal Declaration of, of Human Rights or the International uh, Covenant on Civil and Political uh, uh, Rights recognize the, the in, innate freedom of conscience, which is I guess at the bottom, uh, an individual right. And so uh, one, one hopes that those concepts can take more full root elsewhere besides just the United States. But on, on the, in terms of how we, how culture and, and those rights intersect, uh, there's always gonna be a balance. And um, there are restrictions replete in, in, in every continent on, uh, on the ability to express uh, religion. And those range from restrictions on travel and visas to restrictions on being able to meet uh, together uh, or the involvement of foreigners in, in local uh, worship exercises. They uh, include uh, land use type restrictions and, and uh, you mentioned the headscarves and religious garb, those, those kinds of issues. And there's always gonna be a conflict there and, we, and there needs to be some kind of a, 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 a response to that. And, and I think it just has to come back to these universal individual rights and we need to or human rights, and we need to make sure that those those are present, so that when those conflicts arise, we can resolve them in an appropriate way. I would um, agree, and uh, there is a, a delicate balance between the, the cultural issues, particularly in societies unlike ours. We're very uh, culturally diverse and pluralistic society and with other countries it is such as France they don't have necessarily the same experience and so you, it, be, it it plays itself out as a religious issue but I think it's really it, at its root is something different from religious freedoms it's really more about how the country sees itself and how it is going to grow to accept the a diversity of culture and a diversity of thought as they move into uh, into uh, the future, and you see that in France, they're just not. A, it's a country which has, in the last several years, become much more diverse than it, it has historically been. And as they live with those challenges, challenges which we have had here and successfully, uh, at least to some extent, maneuvered, they're trying to deal with those. And it's taken the face of the head scars, but it's really something that's that really I think is a deeper issue. Uh, and I go back to something that my colleague said about the ideolo ideological proselytization and how you, uh, is it really about faith or is it really about trying to coerce people into an homogenized group? And I think that's what we see in, in other places around the world where they have not had the challenge of having to work through issues of diversity and issues of pluralism, or cultural pluralism. Um, so it's a very fine line, a very difficult line to walk. And one we have to be careful with as we are engaged with our international partners and not being paternalistic uh, about how we engage them and also understanding that they are walking waters that we have already walked. Um, and, and so we need to be sensitive while at the same time seeking to protect the human rights of those who, who have different beliefs and are trying to live their own lives and in the countries that haven't quite caught up with them yet. Just want to add there, yeah, that definitely, this is why I believe there needs to be international reg re regulations or at, at least an international understanding uh, on religious groups uh, and religious activities uh, especially in what we're talking about, uh, parts of the Muslim world uh, and in other, other parts like uh, Eastern Europe, because there needs to be a recognition and a respect for the cultural um, uh, practices uh, of, of these countries uh, that may or may not have anything to do with religion. And we don't want to create another clash uh, or uh, reinforce the notion of a clash of civilizations. Um, and it's pr to protect religious groups 
uh, as well, uh, and their workers. Um, the, the other issue in terms of France, and I think this is where we need to look at the difference between France and America. I think America's definition of secularism is, is in my opinion, the right one, in, a, in that we are neutral on religion. Whereas in France and in many parts of Europe, this sense of anti-religion, like no religious expression whatsoever, not just for Muslims, but for Jews and for uh, so many other religious groups. Definitely Mormons have uh, quite a challenge uh, in France as well. So this notion of being anti-religion is a form of secular fundamentalism and secular militancy of trying to homogenize people who are part of French society but are not completely, quote unquote, culturally accepted within French society. So they use the headscarf as a, really a political uh, issue, becomes politicized. Uh, and then it leads to this larger problem of Islamophobia. Uh, and we have to look at proselytism and religious freedom, but also proselytism and Islamophobia in how certain groups advance their religious interests and engage in Islamophobia. I mean, when somebody says Islam is an evil religion or the prophet is a pedophile and so on and so forth, and you expect that group to go in and, and everything is, you know, peachy king, hunky-dory in, in the region when you insult uh, the religion and the prophet and then you wonder why there's a clash, we are, we're, 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 we're not really understanding that Islamophobia is a major cause of that problem and anti-Western, anti-American sentiment and Islamophobia are actually interdependent. There's anti-American sentiment that is proportional to Islamophobia. There's Islamophobia that's proportional to anti-American sentiment. I, I just wanted to, add, I agree with that. And I think that that's what you know, the, the Grimm and Fink studies show too, is there is a high degree of correlation between uh, regulation and then religious persecution and social pressures. And the question mentioned the codes of conduct, I thought it'd be helpful just to read one paragraph from a draft code of conduct. This is from the Oslo Coalition. Um, it's a code that's being developed. When com coming from the outside to another society, we will be sensitive to cultural differences within that society and adjust accordingly and avoid actions that are considered disrespectful and objectionable in that society, including those def defined as such for religious reasons. However, we should not be constrained by cultural norms that are opposed to the freedom to promote and receive ideas. And for me, that expresses the balance. Before we take this next question, there's a large body of students over here. And so students, after this question, the next question, I'm gonna give preferential treatment to a student. If, I haven't seen any hands from you, by the way, but if you wanna jump into this, also, I'm warning uh, you now. Point, uh, Mr. Chairman, if, if uh, they have our emails, we, we're more than happy to answer questions online. That's Wonderful. Well. We can make that available if you like. So, right here. Just one second. Uh, okay. Yes, please. Okay, the, uh, w uh, sorry, uh, Paul Marshall, the Hudson Institute. Um, we've raised questions about you know, the possible meanings of the term uh, uh, proselytism. Um, I'd also like to flag the term missionary or mission, because I'm, it's, that's another term whose, whose meaning is not apparent. Um, a couple of background issues to this. If I could just give one example. <clears throat> a couple of years ago, um, CNN had a uh, series of programs called God's Warriors and looked at militant Christian groups and then says, danger of religion and violence. Well, it proves nothing of the kind. Those are simply the groups you looked at. One could produce a, a um, TV program called Warriors and show a whole range of groups and their potential for violence and therefore demonstrate that human beings are quite capable of violence for any number of reasons. Um, similarly, if we're talking about proselytism, um, do we wish to restrict that to things usually defined as religious or if we're looking at making this problematic and talking about regulations, uh, would we apply it, say, to feminist movements who are seeking to impact traditional cultures, uh, to environmental movements, uh, to people who want to extend enlightenment um, values generally, say, to the activity of the French, the Belgians, the Turks, um, who have aggressive programs to spread secularism, 
the you know the the Belgian government funds uh, uh, lay uh, missionaries of laicite going abroad. So uh, my concern is this: that um, I think some of the ways we're framing this, we're privileging a lot of self-proclaimed more secular or enlightenment views, which are then presumed to be sort of rational and open, and they're free to go. But religious groups, religious groupings, are somehow much more dangerous and should be restricted. So that wasn't a question, it was a speech, so I'll make it a question. What do you think of that? <laughs> <laughs> that's, a fantastic, uh, that's a fantastic framing of a related issue that directly relates to this. So why don't I start at my left and we'll, we'll come I, mean, I, I, I think uh, my opening remarks were pretty much in line with exactly what you're saying, that we need to look at all groups, whether they call themselves religious or secular, and it's the practices that are the issue, okay. not the nature of the groups. Uh, I would echo uh, my earlier remarks in my opening uh, remarks that I think we engage in a lot of things that we don't call proselytism, but they are proselytism. It's an attempt to convince people of a point of view, whatever that might be, and we generally use it to apply to faith and religion, but it can be used in any broad number of um, situations, circumstances, and applications. Uh, I'm, I'm from a faith community that refuses to use the term missionary. Because, we, because of the negative connotations that it has overseas and in terms of uh, uh, many years ago how indigenous people were treated and how they are, how they perceive missionaries from, and their cultural circumstance as people who came to uh, give them the Bible while they took the land. Uh, so in my tradition, we don't, we, if we do overseas work, we would never call ourselves missionaries because we think of it has a negative connotation. Um, I think that in, in agreeing with my colleague that the government, you have to draw a, a, a very bright, neon bright line in terms of where the government gets involved in issues of persuasion and, and, and proselytization. And if, if someone wants to convert, that's none of the, quite frankly, none of the government's business. And the government shouldn't be involved in taking note of it, not taking note of it, counting or framing or, or any of that. It's just gotta, it's gotta, we've gotta separate a church from state in, in our in relationships. I'll just be, be brief here. I think you've got a resounding amen. <laughs> we have a, um, and, and to the point that there are lots of other groups that are involved with uh, some kind of a, what might be construed as a proselytizing effort for non-religious but maybe more secular uh, purposes. I think that it highlights that re rights to religious persuasion are, are often compromised even though comparable right, rights are not. And, uh, and I think that that's a shame. Um, just like a person can freely advocate his or her religious or political views, they ought to be able to advocate religious views as well. Mm -hmm. Great. So, one of the pleasures of being at Georgetown is our very smart student body. Do we have a question from here? <laughs> and we attract smart students from other campuses as well. Very, very, very hospitable. So I'll say that again. <laughs> Hello. I have questions about the international regulations you've been speaking about. And I was actually just wondering more specifically what type of regulations you think should be promoted. And I like from what frame of reference, whether it should be the UN or the EU or individual governments. And I was just hoping you could answer that more specifically. Matt, will you start? Well, I, I'm not an advocate of international regulation. Rather, I think that the um, that churches ought to be the ones to uh, self-regulate on on those points and, and communities in general, because it goes both ways. I think there ought to be a, a, just rooting in the existing human rights uh, that are reflected in the international compacts. I would argue for international regulation. I think that voluntary uh, regulation. Uh, often means voluntary compliance uh, and for something that has this big of an impact. I, in my perfect world, I'd love to see uh, governments, 
come together because in the end, those are the people who uh, meet out uh, uh, consequences to say here's what is allowable and here's what he's come to a common understanding of proselytization and here's what's allowed and here's not allowed and here's what we can all sign on to. I think barring that you have people, some faiths who will agree, some who won't, some you know changing definitions and when we're talking about a, a world that is uh, that sees these things differently, it, it impacts the lives of people and their ability to do uh, mission work or relief work in other parts of the world. I think a clear understanding of, what's, of what the rules of engagement are would be important. I, I agree that there needs to be international regulations because it, it only takes a few groups to really spoil it for the rest. And unfortunately, there have been too many stories that are either true or not true, but again, it creates a perception uh, of uh, improper inducements, uh, economic incentives uh, in exchange for conversion. Um, and and it, ge it gives also a, an inflated number of uh, religious conversions. Uh, and, and also, uh, unfortunately, uh, situations of kidnapping, uh, stories of kidnapping at least. Um, and I'm not just referring to the, the case in, in, in Haiti, but I'm referring to uh, other cases throughout the world. So if, if that is a problem, then for the protection of the religious groups that are conducting themselves properly, I think we need to protect them and there needs to be an agreement so that governments overseas do not improperly seize the activities of these religious groups that are conducting themselves in a proper way. And short of an international agreement, then we have to respect the laws of the countries. And I know the Mormon church, I just visited Salt Lake City, they have a strict rule that they only go where they are, they are invited. So you, you will look on the map where they're not, they don't have a presence because they, they will only go where it, it's open to go and, go and preach. Ideally, we do want the free market of ideas, all ideas. Ultimately, that's what religion is supposed to do because the argument is if you allow for freedom and freedom of choice, then innate, innately in all of us there's that nature to pursue the truth and pursue God. Uh, that's what we were all created with, that pursuit uh, of God and what is godly. So creating freedom and free environments is really the, the, the objective uh, of governments, of, of religious groups and secular groups. Super. Well, in a few moments, I will invite those of you who still have questions to come forward and to uh, engage the speakers directly during the break. But I'm going to take the chair's prerogative to ask the last question. And it's the so what question. Uh, we've had a lot of interesting comments from the floor and from our panelists. But my question for them in closing is, so what for U.S. foreign policy? What recommendation would you like to make or what observation would you like to make about what we do well or what do we do poorly with regards to official U.S. foreign policy on this issue abroad? And why don't I start here and we'll, we'll come this way. Well, just really briefly, I think what the U.S. does well in is the promotion of civil society uh, as really the uh, first responders uh, and uh, the groups that take care of the needs and opening space for civil society uh, in, in countries abroad where there may not be that same structure. There's the government and there's the people and there's nothing in between. Uh, so the promotion of civil society is, is, is right. Uh, number two, I want to go back to one of the points that I think is really the larger question is not imposing our set of cultural values. And even me as a Muslim American, I have a different set of cultural uh, framework than a Muslim in Egypt or a Muslim in Saudi Arabia or a Muslim in Iran, but respecting the different cultures while uh, coalescing around uh, the values of human rights and freedom and justice. Religion without justice is exploitation. Uh, so we, we must keep that as, as really the centerpiece of, of, of what we're working on. And thirdly, we have to uh, debunk the myth of the clash of civilization, civilizations and sometimes this issue of proselytism, uh, of religious charitable uh, giving um, where, when it's preferential to one group over another reinforces the clash of, clash of civilization and we have to keep that in mind as well as we pursue international regulation, pursue how religious groups are uh, working and, and also uh, promote more 
coalitions of different religious groups working together in common areas of interest? I would um, say that I think what we do well is really providing an example of a free and open society where people can uh, choose and live out their faith or choose to not live out of faith and that we all live together in relative uh, harmony, uh, tea party is notwithstanding. Uh, I had to get that in. Uh, I think where we can improve is I think we need a better understanding or we need to take more seriously the role of faith in countries around the world. Uh, increasingly, faith is part of or driving factor in many of the countries with which we are attempting to develop relationships around the world. And I think to the extent that we don't understand that or we don't appreciate that, or to the extent that we feel that our way of separating faith from politics is the way that everyone else should function as well, it creates a problem in countries where that's not the way, where faith and politics is uh, intimately intertwined. So I think that we've got to do a better job of understanding that and, uh, and then engaging uh, the, the various faith leaders around the world, and some of those faith leaders are also uh, government leaders. We have to understand that they are where they are where they are that they are driven by their faith, and for them that's very real. And we can't make a judgment on that. That is their reality, and we've got to do a better job appreciating that, understanding that, and engaging them in a very authentic way, uh, understanding that faith is a foundational uh, part of their existence. I agree with both my colleagues, um, and I think it's possible to have that kind of engagement on religious issues, while at the same time not advocating for any particular religious viewpoint. And I think that the United States has a role in, uh, again, uh, targeting back to the human rights in, in promoting those as, as general universal rights that are not just merely American interests. I think it's most effective to do that in partnership with others who have similar ideals. and. Um, and then just also a recognition that the right to religious uh, persuasion deserves the same regard as other human rights. Uh, thanks. Well, I thought I might be able to get them to come out on Afghanistan or Iraq <laughs> or something like that with that question. That did not happen, but you can get them on the break. First, let me just say that in 30 minutes, intellectual sparks will fly in a gentlemanly fashion when we have a discussion or a debate between our own Jose Casanova of Georgetown University and Gerard Bradley of the University of Notre Dame. And there's a lunch provided before that. But before we get there, would you please help me in uh, showing our appreciation to these panelists? Thank you. <laughs>